I, I am a pediatrician. I love being a pediatrician. It was a really lucky guess on my part. Um, but actually, in the middle, to, to have the texture of being invited to come to Nebraska to give a speech is just is, is wonderful. And people said, have I ever been to Nebraska before? No. <laughs> uh, and, and to say, do you do this often? No. <laughs> but, um, uh, but that's that's what makes it really really precious to me. Uh, this picture up here is uh, me, um, and that is not a picture of mental illness. That's a picture of a strong, together person who is 22 years old um, and uh, in 1970 going to the wilds of British Columbia and setting up a commune uh, because Western civilization was collapsing. It sounds funny now, but uh, an awful lot of our teachers, an awful lot of our parents, and we certainly believe that. Um, and um, so people, you know, this, I, I love this picture, but I did not feel mentally ill there, not even a little bit. But the fact that uh, I lost, from this point, I lost about 25 pounds and was considerably more straggly and my friends who were good counterculture people kept me away from police and away from medical help. Uh, by the time I reached the hospital, I was so incoherent, it took me a while to, a while to get me back, um, that I was diagnosed as a bad, I was having uh, you know, schizophrenia, schizophrenia, people like to pronounce it both ways. Um, don't want to dwell too much on that because I don't think diagnosis ends up making that much difference. Um, I was then, because I cleared up uh, somewhat, uh, became a schizophrenic who might do well on lithium. And uh, again, we should not make fun of the doctors who came before us. They were doing the best they could. And I was, in fact, a schizophrenic who did pretty well on lithium. And, uh, and then I got promoted by the Harvard Admissions Committee. I, um, because the, the, my whole interview with them, based on was I schizophrenic or not, um, and they finally, in exasperation, said, if you were schizophrenic, we would not admit you. We are admitting you, therefore, we have <laughs> <laughs> And I know when to shut up in an argument. <laughs> um, for me, and in my family, I always thought it was kind of interesting uh, that so many of my relatives are in the arts. Um, um, it, but I, what I have come to see is that it is absolutely life-saving. Um, and the arts, you know, writing, I think without writing, um, my father would have been just another a uh, veteran of PTSD who probably couldn't have kept it together, but because he wrote, and he wrote well, and I think doing the arts well are protective against mental illness, and I think they also help you be a better doctor. Um, he got to have a life, he got to have children, and he got to be blasé about standing up and having and talking to people. <laughs> How can you not be thrilled? <laughs> this is so cool. Um, so I'm going to click through these, and it, it's amazing to me that all this sort of works. So this is Dostoevsky, and among the unambiguously mentally ill people, uh, they, we have Dostoevsky, we have Van Gogh, we have people who have given us great art and made us a lot less lonely, and um, rather than the lust for life uh, you know, vision where Van Gogh was so creative and made him crazy. He would have been a lot crazier if he hadn't painted. Uh, and I love the fact that there is now good historical uh, evidence that he didn't shoot himself. He, even artists are not so stupid that they shoot themselves in the belt. If you try to kill yourself, you go for your head. Uh, but, uh, so any, anyway, I love the fact that um, arts are in fact protected. So one of the things I fear when I talk about uh, creativity and mental illness, and I'm going to end up uh, uh, just sort of, the, the, the stigma will be there anyway, and now, now I'm going to stigmatize creativity. <laughs> there we go. Um, Longest Monk is very interesting because he is a complete genius who 
uh, like me, was initially diagnosed as having schizophrenia. I think partly because he looked so different to doctors. Among other things, uh, in the 60s, it was really hard for black people to be diagnosed as manic depressive because I think they were different enough socially and culturally that it was almost automatic. Uh, and as I was a hippie, so I got that diagnosis. I think Thelonious Monk was diagnosed as having, but eventually he, he was also tried on lithium. And I also want to point out that the diagnosis uh, doesn't make a difference. All the people I know who are working with uh, people with mental illness, like the Fountain House, like the Clubhouse Movement, like um, they, uh, you know, I've been to these places and I've looked at the good work they're doing. They are housing the homeless, they are clothing the naked, etc. Um, and I, I said, I'd love to ask the question, so what uh, ICD-9 diagnosis do these people have? And they look at me and they say, we have no idea. You know? And especially now, uh, where it's absolutely mainstream to treat um, uh, people with, manic, with psychosis and manic depression, and even without psychosis, with atypical antipsychotics, and it's also mainstream with the schizophrenic uh, shows any effective component, they are, you know, let's try a mood stabilizer. So it's not like it has, you know, putting somebody in one camp or the other. And I continue to believe that calling somebody schizophrenic is a way of giving up on them. Um, yeah. I have a lot of wonderful people in my family who can talk to voices and do the laundry. <laughs> and they can go to the grocery store and and everything like that. And it's a blessing to me that I can't. I, I fall apart. Um, but it's also been very helpful to me uh, when I was trying to recover from this illness. And I just said, I said, Mom, I, I just can't take the voices. And she completely, she didn't miss a beat. She said, why don't you just go along with them? That's what I do. <laughs> it was this Phi Beta Kappa, very, very charming, beautiful, wonderful woman who raised three of her own kids, and we took in four first cousins, and she mothered the whole damn neighborhood. At the same time, she was, at times, almost as crazy as I was. She, she was always, uh, she always had uh, crystals, ESP, da 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 da, da and um, and she always believed that if she left the house and she didn't have the light switches in the right patterns, it would burn down before we got back. But so she can go, and a lot of people can have low levels of, of these charming delusions um, and get along with us fine. I cannot, and, uh, and that's a good thing for me. Let me see. So anyway, creativity is inversely proportional to mental illness, not the other way around. Nobody chucks their meds and writes great novels or paints great paintings. The arts are both a reason and a way to get well. The last thing any hospital should get rid of is art therapy. And the great art, the fact that my father was able to write as well as he did and Van Gogh painted and stuff like that, is because there is something about being in crisis and fighting against it and finding a way with some kind of art to tell the truth which lets you survive. Um, uh, bipolar disease has a very high fatality rate. An awful lot of people in their 20s kill themselves. And, but if you, if you have art going for you, uh, I think you have a much better chance of surviving. One of my, here comes one of my favorite books. This is, this is William Faulkner. <laughs> <laughs> and he should know. <laughs> you know um, and there, there is, especially in the you know, American arts and letters and stuff like that, um, alcoholism is, is incredible, but the correlation, but they all had to sober up to get to, to produce their good art. Uh, and then they make a drink again. That's, that's all right, but the Faulkner, very concise way of saying. Um, yeah. 
I, I blew up. I, you know, I love Harvard because they have these huge committees for everything, but the only people who could be part of the committee were academics who had never taken care of patients and retired people who had whatever. But I tried to be part of the admissions committee for a while, but, and it was wonderful, all the attention we gave to every application. But they would say, oh, this application is a little weak on the extras, and extras were the arts. And I, blew, I said, the arts are not extra. They're not extracurricular. They're, you know, they're about as extra as breathing. Um, so don't think of the arts as this nice thing you might do to be a better rounded person. Uh, they can and will often save your life. Uh, and I, there are many, many great positions. The writer is not a confectioner, a cosmetic dealer, or an entertainer. He is a man who has signed a contract with his conscience and his sense of duty. I should say he is not a slave to metrics or best practices. <laughs> <laughs> and Chekhov, all, all the brilliant writer, he also said, if you have a gun on the mantelpiece in the first act, it has to be used by the third. <laughs> And the other thing about the arts is, is, is there's not much um, you know, involved. You can just take a yellow pad and start doing it. Uh, you don't need an agent uh, or whatever. And um, I think the next slide, whatever. It, it really, you know, it seemed to be a lot less dangerous than some of the things I could be doing. And the delusion uh, that I was working on a book, which was going to change the way people thought about mental illness, possibly be the end of mental illness forever, uh, was a lot less dangerous than a lot of the things I've been thinking. Uh, I, I can't help myself, I okay. can't. <laughs> but there is a thing about that. Anybody <laughs> publishing? Uh, it's good to have an agent so you can throw a pen, throw a pen against the wall and fire the faster. <laughs> Uh, Freud, wonderful, wonderful writer, but again, um, you know, if you read his letters and stuff, if that man's not neurotic, nobody's neurotic, um, but he struggled so hard to put things in the right way, and I love that it was not medicine, uh, but it was in literature that he was nominated for a Nobel Prize, and he should have gotten it. And there's him as a young man, looks like Chekhov. Uh, and I love the things that writers say. Um, the differential diagnosis is a list of competing narratives. Uh, and if you actually practice yourself trying to write a narrative, you'll be able to, to listen better to other people's narratives. <laughs> I remember, you guys still have bunk beds in the young call room, but anyway, was with this junior who was younger than me, he said, if you can write, why the hell would you want to do this? What I, I, I just said, I just mowed you around or whatever. And, and I said, if you could write, you would know why I want to do this. That's <laughs> what I should have said. Being a pediatrician is really a blast for me. It has its challenges, but I just, uh, uh, it's, it's great. Louis Fernand Celine, um, shot in the head during World War One. The noise wouldn't go away, so he became a really, really good writer don't deserve the restraint we show by not going into a little delirium in front of him. <laughs> he, he was absolutely you know, brilliant and, and viciously contemptuous of most of his patients and parents, but he was a wonderful man. Ah, my favorite pediatrician, William Carlos Williams. And if you haven't read the doctor stories, um, there are things about being a doctor that don't change. And I think his series of short stories tell you what those are. I don't know what he said. They give you line of paper right the other way. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful physician who always thought of himself as a physician, even though he never really practiced, um, is Walker Percy. Uh, he's written brilliantly about being a doctor. You can get all A's and still want life. Oh, 
Why did Dr. Conlon Doyle? Whenever you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And that's such a wonderful way to go at a clinical encounter as opposed to getting out of your asthma uh, you know, decision. Keats, also a physician. Beauty is truth, truth is beauty, that's all you need to know on earth and all you need to know. Um, so anytime anybody tries to put you as a doctor in a box and tell you that you are some sort of um, you know, cheap labor or something like that saying, these are my ancestors. <laughs> I will honor my ancestors, including the one of these. Very dull, very care. My advice to you is to have comfort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. As delusions go, and I, I, I work with the Mass uh, 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 Medical Society and their physicians' health people who try to get in between the Board of Registration, which is a bunch of lawyers now, and sort of protect our. The idea you're working on a book that will make a difference is relatively harmless. Uh, it's much less bad than other things you might be doing. And, and at least there's no screen for broken glass. And I do think the arts always have and always will. Um, if you do the arts, they rein you in and make you better. They do not make you crazy. Who? If you sing the first words, First verse fast enough, the second verse will come. <laughs> He's like the big one. And uh, Daniel Oprey is uh, she is the editor. She started the Bellevue uh, Literary Review, which I think comes out a couple times a year. It's medical students, residents, doctors, and they have uh, fiction and nonfiction. And I think it's I find it inspirational to read poetry uh, and the short pieces uh, that other physicians and medical students are writing. We must probe the patient's story as gently as we help me thereafter, never going beyond the point of wincing, never causing pain for pain's sake. We must listen for the human underpinnings as delicately as we listen for diastolic murmurs. <laughs> we must examine the tender edges of despair as gingerly as we would explore the ragged edges of a wound. And then we must look the patient and their story directly in the eye at the end of the encounter and ask ourselves if we have made a connection that is scheduled. Um, and I don't, I think that this is why people want to be doctors when they're growing up. Um, we're very good citizens and we want to be tier one doctors and we want to get uh, certificates and quality improvement and so forth and so on. Uh, but a lot of times that I, in my view, is leading us away from the reasons we became doctors and this is more of why we became doctors. I'll joke on myself, no one who is as happy with how and what he or she thought would bother to write. No one who was comfortable with themselves would bother to have credentials as good as mine. <laughs> Harvard Medical School and intern at Mass General. Uh, how insecure did I have to be? <laughs> and I do believe, uh, in, in fact, uh, the whole stigma of mental illness is much more in this room than in the outside world. Patients care less and less. Uh, my last book, I do try to keep this little uh, boundary, and my wife came in and put my book up around and I said, no, that, that's bad. I don't want my patients to mental illness have a stigma, but you're great. So my first patient comes in and she says, Dr. Vonnegut, I didn't know you had mental illness. <laughs> I'm really worried about Travis. So the, 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 the whole stigma thing was done with in less than a second.